thank you very much. Uh, I would like to um, congratulate the um, organizing committee for making this possible. Um, so, so my presentation focused on ASEAN and US-China rivalry uh, by put on the question, how, how can ASEAN navigate uh, this geopolitical landscape? Um, as, as, all, as we know, um, the, the, the China-US rivalry is intensifying and it is perhaps uh, a, a medium term to long term issues uh, that affect uh, the regional geopolitical economic landscape uh, across the Asia Pacific regions. So this kind of uh, the, 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 the combination of the three triggers, uh, structural power competition, uh, the power shift, global power shift uh, between the status quo power versus the rising power, uh, the dynamics uh, of the domestic politics in both countries, especially the uh, nationalism, uh, further complicate uh, the bilateral relationship. And of course, it comes down to the leadership and the worldview of the leaders uh, between the two countries. So, so these uh, three triggers uh, will further prolong uh, the competition and rivalry between the two uh, major powers. So my proposal is that ASEAN and Southeast Asia, we need to learn uh, to survive and adapt and thrive in this context. There are areas of competitions, as we all know, from trade technology to military and ideology. So I think trade and military, perhaps in the past we experienced this, including the ideology during the Cold War, but technology is perhaps some is an emerging new uh, area of competition and rivalry. And uh, uh, recently, uh, President Xi Jinping at the uh, uh, CPC dialogue with uh, uh, other world political party uh, meant, used the word technology blockade uh, by the US against China. And he called for other countries to, uh, you know, to, to break the barrier, this kind of a trade uh, blockade. So this is uh, something that I think really uh, create uh, a challenge and concern for uh, the economy, economy of ASEAN because uh, we, we still not yet decided uh, which uh, kind of platform, technological platform, which 5G network sh that should we adopt. Of course, some countries already decided but with the different uh, company from different countries. So with that scenario, can we stay digitally connected? Can we promote digital trade uh, in e-commerce within the region? So that is uh, the new area that I find it is quite interesting to observe this kind of technological competition and it affects on the old economic uh, uh, order uh, in Asia. Look at the China strategy. Of course, it wished to become uh, a recognized and respected global power. Uh, and that is the, the common kind of sense. Uh, uh, I, I use the word of the Emeritus um, Prime Minister of Singapore said lately at the uh, Tsinghua University that uh, China is growing, you know, it's uh, uh, so it needs more space. Uh, it's a natural phenomenon. So in the past, we have uh, one or two elephants, uh, smaller elephant, but now have bigger elephants in the room and several other small elephants in the room. So the room needs to be enlarged. So rather than trying to contain China, they need to expand the space that can accommodate different elephants in the room. So that perhaps is something that we, we need to move forward, uh, that naturally China are going to expand power across the region and the world. That is a natural phenomenon as a rising power. Uh, China aims to build a great modern socialist country in all aspects by uh, uh, 2049. Again, uh, this is the vision of uh, China in the new era, especially uh, Xi Jinping's thought on socialism uh, Chinese, uh, with Chinese characteristics. So moving forward, uh, this is, uh, is a kind of ideological uh, front lines uh, between China and, and the West, so to speak, when it comes to uh, socialism versus um, um, 
other system, right? Uh, some they call it the free world. Uh, community of with the chef future um, uh, recently, especially um, uh, at uh, a meeting between the CPC and other world political party, President Xi mentioned several times this word of building a community with a shared future. Across Southeast Asia, uh, Cambodia and Laos already signed uh, the action plans on building a community of shared future. Uh, Myanmar uh, already agreed in principle, uh, but other countries are still uh, cautious with regard to exceeding to signing the action plan to realize a community of shared future. So again, this is a new world vision uh, of China uh, in order to mobilize support, uh, friendship and partnership with other countries. And also uh, Xi Jinping uh, stressed this uh, UN-centric world order. It's, it perhaps is the first time the, that uh, China really uh, clearly articulate this uh, worldview of China is to build a new world order with uh, uh, the UN is at the center. Again, um, you know, different country have different views with the UN centric world order. Uh, so this is the, the division to challenge the, the European or, or US centric or the West centric world order uh, to make the world become more inclusive and fair from the Chinese perspective uh, so that the UN should be at the center of the, the, the world order. When I come to some of the regional initiatives, uh, of course, we all aware of the Bell and Road Initiative, the establishment of AIIB, Atlanta Mekong Corporation, and the new uh, International Land Sea Trade Corridor. Here, I just would like to highlight LMC, which has recently adopted uh, a series of uh, agreements, uh, including uh, LMC, uh, uh, kind of a, a cooperation on SDGs and the role of the local governments in promoting uh, LMC. So when it comes to the role of local governments, again, when it comes to, re this is something quite new uh, when it comes to uh, China uh, regional integration uh, because China in the past is not so confident of giving more power to the local authority to engage uh, neighboring countries and engage in this regional integration and connectivity. But it seems that China is shift, has shifted its uh, kind of diversify its uh, actors, international actors, by giving more power and authority and of legitimacy to the local authorities of, from different regions in China to engage uh, the Mekong region as well as Southeast Asia. Look at the, the United States. Of course, the ultimate interest and goal of the US to, to maintain its supremacy. In other words, is how the US can stay uh, as the number one, right? So the rising power need to be checked or contained at all costs uh, by all measure uh, in order to maintain its supremacy. So from the security perspective, of course, uh, China is not that threatening to the U.S. security, you know, uh, but it, it is a threat to the U.S. supremacy. So that we need to distinguish, make a distinction between the U.S. interests and the U.S. supremacy in the U.S. Uh, policy toward China. Of course, uh, under Joe Biden, uh, alliance system have been uh, uh, strengthened and enhanced, but again, uh, the trust in the U.S. leadership remain a bit uh, not that solid uh, because of whether Joe Biden uh, still wins the next election or Donald Trump faction or the, you know, can come to power after the next election. So that is uncertainty when it comes to domestic politics in the US and, and how it affects US role in, in this alliance system. Um, so, so I don't think all the US ally we put all the trust and confidence in the US in terms of this kind of, uh, uh, um, you know, the uncertainty when it comes to uncertainty in the US leadership. Democracy is back, uh, uh, diplomacy is back, uh, those are two slogans uh, pronounced uh, by the, the Joe Biden administration. Uh, well, we, we see this uh, is unfolding, uh, could see the very proactive uh, US engagement across the world. And we can see the 
the emphasis uh, that have been re-emphasized, uh, that have uh, been stressed on democracy and human rights when it comes to the U.S. relation with ASEAN, some countries of East Asia. Some of the U.S. initiative uh, includes uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. I think as uh, some panelists discussed earlier, there are different versions of free and open and Indo-Pacific. Perhaps India version is the more inclusive, or, or Japan uh, is a bit more inclusive than perhaps the US version of free and open Indo-Pacific, which is widely believed as a strategy to contain China. But India has made it clear this is this doesn't attempt to uh, contain any country or target any country. Uh, so different uh, version, uh, vision with regard to the free and open Indo-Pacific and uh, there's no strong consensus also uh, when it comes to uh, the, either the, the, the free and open Indo-Pacific will be transformed into what we call uh, uh, Asian NATO or in the Indo-Pacific. A blue dot network, uh, also a, a strategy uh, developed to uh, promote uh, what we call a quality infrastructure uh, across the, 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 the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and of course, the, the U.S. recently upgraded uh, the lower Mekong initiative to a Mekong-U.S. partnership, which, which is a, a, a significant milestone in the U.S.-Mekong uh, engagement. Uh, and more substance and more uh, concrete action uh, are, going to be, are going to take place uh, in the, to strengthen the U.S. presence and image and influence in the Mekong. Of course, the future of the Quad uh, in connection to the free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, whether the Quad is still being transformed into the Asian NATO, that is still a big question mark. In terms of ASEAN agencies, uh, ASEAN, of course, uh, throughout the history, especially at the peak of the Cold War back in the 1970s and 80s, uh, play critical role in uh, solving the Cambodia problem, uh, provide peace and stability to, to Cambodia. So that is something that needs to be recognized. Uh, and that help us to, to be more uh, uh, optimistic about ASEAN. I look at the past history of ASEAN in dealing with the regional conflict and diffuse. But uh, the world we are living now and in the future uh, especially within the pandemic age or the post-pandemic era, uh, perhaps this time is different from, from back in the 1970s to 80s. It's more uh, dynamic, or multi-dimensional, and more actors uh, involved. Uh, so, so the question of resilience of ASEAN is something that uh, we need to explore uh, to, to find assumptions, hypotheses, whether and how to strengthen ASEAN uh, resilience, so to speak, when it comes to security issues. Uh, in order to enhance the ASEAN agencies, uh, we need to meet three conditions. First, uh, we need to have a strong political leadership at home and abroad, uh, because uh, all foreign policy are, you know, are closely connected with the domestic politics and national interests. So we, we need to have a type of political leadership that can connect uh, domestic politics, national interests with the ASEAN uh, regional community building. There are some deviations from, from ASEAN, including Indonesia. Some believe that we have Indonesia should leave ASEAN uh, and join other bigger clubs, like G20, you know, pay more attention to those bigger clubs. Anyway, uh, different expectation uh, across the region, uh, but we, we need the strong uh, political consensus and leadership across the region to connect national interest with ASEAN. Uh, we need also diplomatic capacities. Uh, this is a, a challenge uh, uh, for, for ASEAN uh, because uh, some have mentioned uh, that uh, the diplomatic capacity of ASEAN is not as strong as expected to be. Um, and a third point here is institutional capacity. Look at the ASEAN Secretariat, uh, look at the budget, look at the human resources. Uh, it's still far behind, much far behind other, like, let's say compared with the European Union, for instance, in terms of budget. Uh, 
So, so we need to invest more financial resources, uh, human resources in the institutional building of ASEAN. And of course, I think some panelists mentioned the ASEAN chair, the capacity of ASEAN chair, from one chair to another chair. So we can't expect, let's say, a small countries uh, to deliver as much as a, a big or middle power, right? Uh, so that um, we need to, to understand that this reality of the, the different uh, capacities of ASEAN chair. So threat and risk uh, that ASEAN is facing uh, is the intensifying US-China rivalry, which is will be a medium and long-term issues. We don't know how many more years, and it can last for 20, 20 years or more than a decade. I look at the domestic political dynamics uh, across East Asia. So some political leaders are very occupied, preoccupied with domestic issues. And uh, a good case now is the, what's going on in Myanmar. So, I, so that really uh, harmful to, to, to ASEAN. Uh, look at the ASEAN unity and centrality. So these two terms need to go hand in hand. You cannot have ASEAN centrality without ASEAN unity. Right? And uh, whether a binary choice that, that imposed by uh, uh, both the competing powers will, will become reality. It's, uh, what we can do is to prolong the, the, the time that not to be forced to take two sides. But I, I think the now is uh, it's coming uh, very soon uh, that some country uh, already, already have been forced to take sides. Uh, in particular, Cambodia, after the visit of Wendy Sherman, um, the senior official, Cambodian senior official came uh, to talk that, uh, uh, to share the view that uh, the US already forced Cambodia to cheat two sides, right? So that is the reality on the ground. And I think we don't, we can't enjoy the privilege not being forced to choose side anymore. So how ASEAN can act together uh, in order to create a shield for its member state uh, to uh, protect the, uh, the, the members from being forced to choose sides. So that is again, uh, is a critical risk and threat to ASEAN. Again, is a uh, last point is about expectation of the role of ASEANs. Uh, I refer to the phrase by a former Singaporean diplomat saying that don't expect a cow to become a horse. So ASEAN has its own uh, strength and limitations and weaknesses, especially when it comes to the conflict resolution and peace security issue uh, due to the principle of non-interference, uh, sovereignty, et cetera. So the issue that will divide ASEAN or weaken ASEAN is Myanmar. Uh, so that is perhaps the, the bottom line. If ASEAN cannot solve or provide a certain degree of solutions to the Myanmar crisis, then I think the relevancy of ASEAN will be at risk. Of ASEAN will be marginalized in this regard. Uh, could not earn respect from, from dialogue partners right? and from the people of ASEAN as well. South China Sea have been a chronic complex issue of, uh, with ASEAN for many years. So that uh, the realization or conclusion of code of conduct, hopefully concluded next year can, can provide a, a new a momentum uh, uh, to, to maintain stabilized peace and stability in the South China Sea. Other two issues, human rights is very divisive issue across Southeast Asia. So how many ASEAN member are the leaders or the role model in terms of human rights democracy. Perhaps only Indonesia in this case, uh, which is one of the largest uh, democracy in Asia, uh, but you know, only one country, only one member cannot do much to shape the democratization and the promote, that promote, promotion of human rights uh, in, in ASEAN. 5G network I mentioned earlier through the competition. So Several countries in Southeast Asia have adopted different system 5G network. So if they, let's say one country adopt the US system or European and the other adopt Chinese system, then how ASEAN can be digitally connected and integrated. So that can issue that can divide ASEAN as well on the technology front. So last uh, slide here is Cambodian chairmanship next year. 
So the key question here for Cambodia is how to navigate US-China rivalry. So some have proposed um, uh, a new uh, kind of uh, framework called ASEAN plus two. The two here is China and the United States. Um, so at, on the side, at the sidelines of East Asia Summit, for instance, perhaps they can have an informal lunch or a meeting between ASEAN and China and the United States. So we need to have a strong consensus uh, among ourselves, ASEAN, whether we, we can uh, uh, implement this ASEAN plus two and whether the US and China support this mechanism. Um, second one, I, I shared with you with others also that the importance of Asian outlook, ASEAN outlook of in, uh, on Indo-Pacific uh, to how to oper operationalize it. So it's not only in the, now it's kind of only in the paper, right? Uh, the declarations. So we need to put it into practice, uh, implementing the, some of the key pillars uh, under the AOIP. And this is the, the way that ASEAN can neutralize uh, on, and navigate uh, our rivalry. If we can effectively operationalize AOIP, we take ownership of the Indo-Pacific, so to speak. Uh, a second issue is comprehensive recovery. So, uh, 2012, Cambodia was a chair of ASEAN. At that time, initiative what we call ASEAN Club Ball Dialogue. So next year, Cambodia will revive this ASEAN Club Ball Dialogue to focus on comprehensive recovery by inviting a representative from international organization, a multilateral institution, a financial institution, and also perhaps multinational companies to attend ASEAN Club Ball Dialogue uh, to discuss uh, comprehensive recovery. And of course, uh, from next year, uh, we expect to imp start implementing RCEP, and this is um, uh, a, a catalyst, a new catalyst to uh, pro further promote and deepen regional trade and connectivities. And the third issue within the comprehensive is how to reduce the development gaps uh, between the ASEAN members. So um, down the road, I think this is indeed a very dangerous world and very dangerous water that ASEAN is uh, navigating through. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Dr. Vanarith.